Boom 97.3, 70s, 80s, 90s. Joining us in studio is Kiefer Sutherland, TV and film actor, singer, songwriter, musician, uh, voiceover talent. And I got to say, as a gal from radio, I really enjoy it listening to your voice. It's really wonderful. Um, and now entrepreneur. So tell us about this new venture that you've you've gotten involved with. Um, it's, a, it's a whiskey uh, called Red Bank. Uh, uh, a dear, dear friend of mine, Gary Briggs, uh, who I've known for 35 years, was a, a very prominent player in the music business through Warner Brothers Records. And uh, we'd known each other for a long time through a lot of mutual music friends. And, uh, he was very good friends with uh, and introduced me to a, a very prominent businessman in Canada named Rob Steele, who uh, is very successful in everything from radio stations to cars and trucks and, and things like that. And he and Gary had been friends for a long time, and they would go on these fishing trips, and they would talk about the romance of kind of having their own brand of whiskey. And, uh, and after about 10 years of kind of, having the conversation, then maybe having a few drinks, and then maybe doing <laughs> nothing about it. Right. Rob Steele said to Gary that he was really serious. He really yeah. wanted to pursue this and and asked if I would be interested. And, and I said I would be very interested in a product uh, that was a kind of a worldwide A-list product that we could take around the world and kind of promote it through the idea of Canada. Um, Something that I've been so fascinated about our country with is that if you take a look at the top, top topography of Canada and the diversity of it, when you take a look at the maritime provinces and then the beautiful lakes of, of, of Quebec and, and, and Ontario and the ruggedness of Manitoba and the mountains of Alberta and the beautiful uh, plains of Saskatchewan and the incredible forests of British Columbia. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so diverse and so extraordinary. And then... I will always tell someone when I'm traveling, if you think that's diversity, wait till you meet the people, uh, because the people are so incredibly diverse. And I, I moved here when I was nine years old, um, and my mother and I and my sister were kind of at a hard point in our, in our lives collectively, and, and my mom too. And we were taken in here in Canada in a way that was um, just really incredibly special. Uh, nice. and, and it's something that has left a profound kind of impression on me. And so I would be very glad to kind of travel the world and talk about how great Canada is. And this product is, is, is a representation of that. Um, so if we were to come up with a whiskey, a Canadian whiskey, that accomplished all of that, I would be thrilled to be a part of it. Mm. And five, six years later in development, uh, they did it. And uh, they created this whiskey that is a defined Canadian whiskey, uh, which has a, kind of a, a wheat profile and a, a rye profile. But unlike most Canadian whiskeys um, that kind of lend themselves to a rye whiskey and kind of lean towards the Southern American whiskeys, um, we have the highest wheat component allowed in a Canadian whiskey. And we have a very low uh, rye profile, which kind of takes the flavor of the whiskey back towards Scotland which I think is, is, is certainly more in keeping with the maritime provinces where, where this is from or where this idea was born. Um, and it certainly is, is in more keeping with my family's heritage. <laughs> and, uh, and so for all of those reasons, uh, I was very excited to be a part of it. And now we've kind of gone this next two years uh, kind of getting it out. And we've had to go province by province because all of the, the laws are different from one mm. province to another. And, and, and we're coming up to home plate. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So, you know, it's interesting because I just read um, about a month ago, the LCBO had just done a study on what their top selling um, products were mm -hmm. for the last quarter from this summer. And, you know, for a long time, everybody was discovering wine. It's spirits and whiskey is the number mm -hmm. one choice of Canadians. So I have to say, your timing is brilliant. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's every once in a while. If you, can't, if you take enough shots at something, you'll right. get lucky. Um, but the truth is, uh, it's, a, a, as fantastic as that is, uh, this is something that is not a shot in the dark. This, mm. is, this is something that, you, that, that is... Uh, part of your life for the rest of your life, and it's 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 something that uh, 
is is hopefully something that is a successful and that you kind of leave to your family. Mm. Uh, and and so it's it's really it's a labor of love and and. Uh, and I hope people enjoy it as much as I do. I hope so, too. The other thing I got to say about whiskey is looking at it as a product, I used to think of it as like, you know, Wild West and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And now it seems to have gotten this sophistication. And I'm thinking, you know, when you think about rock and roll, some of our favorite, you know, sort of wilder guys that you would have associated with uh, whiskey, perhaps <laughs> like the Stones and stuff. They're also now the sophisticated bunch. As we mature, like the the whiskey has, so has sort of that image. Well, I think I think even maybe more than sophistication. I'm going to go back to diversification. Sure. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we did, uh, we we released the whiskey for the very at, at the very beginning in the maritime provinces, and we had a number of events. And one of the most fun, uh, we had twenty or thirty of the best uh, bartenders in Nova Scotia. Uh, that had followings, and, and we brought them all together, and they all knew each other. Uh, and we would have these hysterical contests about setting them up in pairs or mm -hmm. in sets of threes, and, and who could come up with the greatest cocktail, and, and this and that. And what we really started to realize was that I, I've always drank my whiskey straight. I've always drank it neat. Um, and a lot of people, they're not comfortable with that. And so... What I found fascinating was that, that there would be a lot of people at, at a party saying, I never drank whiskey, it was a little harsh for me, and I don't feel that about this whiskey. But then I tried this drink, you know, whether it was a paper plane or a whiskey sour, and it's like, oh my gosh, I love that. And so, yeah, so it's, anyways, it's, it's uh, look, it's, it's all so subjective. Yeah. Everybody's <laughs> palate is what it is. Yeah. Um, I, I've been lucky enough to, to have enough friends of mine uh, that do drink whiskey and really do enjoy it. Uh, to make me feel secure in the knowledge that I think we've produced something very, very special. Um, but it's really up for everybody else to try on their own and, and find their way. In 1891, in an effort to provide an indoor activity for his students to help keep them fit during a particularly harsh winter, Canadian gym teacher James Naismith took two peach crates and invented the game of... <laughs> basketball. Canadian born, proudly Canadian. My growing up here is when I was going to school here in Canada. It was like everybody else's. You know, uh, I just, uh, I had, I had spent a lot of years doing my homework at theaters all around Toronto because oh, okay. that's what my mother did. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had a great affection uh, for the theater and for the people that work there. Um, they always seemed more interesting than, than when I would go to other kids' houses, right? These, <laughs> these people were quite yeah. eccentric and they were fun. And, yeah. and so, so, yeah, I think we're, we're all products of our surroundings. Sure. And that's what I grew up kind of watching. And, and I, I remember actually with my father, I remember apologizing to him when I was 18 when they started having videos because so many mm. of his movies I hadn't been able to see because I was too young and you couldn't go... You know, it's not like you could rent it down the line. Uh, when my father made a film, it came out for three months and then it was gone. And so I didn't get to see films like Clute or Kelly's Heroes right. or MASH or Eye of the Needle uh, uh, or Invasion of the Body Snatchers or any, uh, Fellini's Casanova, mm -hmm. all of these movies, Bertolucci's 1900. These were all films I found later in life. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt really bad that I didn't know what an incredibly important actor he was in the English language. And he said, well, how were you supposed to know? You were a kid. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah. Thinking back on those years, though, here in, in you know, with your mom and your sister and, and hanging out, you, like you said, at, at theaters and things. Do you remember what was your soundtrack back then? What kind of music was sort of playing? My right? soundtrack was actually pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, because I had an older brother, uh, Tom, who was seven years older than me and spent an incredible amount of time with me. He played sports with me. Uh, he fostered my interest in the guitar at a very early age. Uh, and, and he was just a great music listener. Mm. So I was listening to everything from Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, uh, Sly and the Family Stone, and Michael Jackson. And then that would be a category of kind of soul music. 
uh, with a pop overtone. Then I remember I was the only kid in grade two that had an Aerosmith t-shirt. So I was <laughs> listening to everything from Aerosmith to um, um, just kind of other hard rock bands of the time. There, there was the Stones, there was mm. Boston, um, and there was that kind of subcategory. And then there were the Beatles and yeah. uh, and kind of all the classic stuff of that time, everything all the way up to the Kinks and, uh, and the Rolling Stones and all of the kind of fantastic British Invasion stuff. Then there was Elton John, James Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was such a wide cross-section. Uh, and that's what I loved about the music of the, of the late 60s and 70s and even early 80s was <coughs> there was room for all of these genres of music. It did yeah. not have to be dominated by one group. So certainly by the time you got into the late 80s, it was dominated by hair band rock, mm -hmm. and then it was dominated by hip hop, and then it was dominated by grunge rock, and then mm -hmm. it was dominated by hip hop again. And it just somehow was unfortunate that it couldn't all live together like it yeah. once had. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's a product of just change, right? The right change guess, in radio, yeah. change in everything. Um, but I do remember feeling very, very fortunate uh, to have that uh, as a young person growing up so that when I actually did kind of, when I was old enough to start choosing music for myself and, and I was still of a generation where this music represents who I was, I could navigate between The Clash and Michael Jackson. Right. I could I could tolerate both of those. Yeah. Right. And and uh, and I could you know, and I I loved Rush, and I didn't mean I couldn't love Neil Young. Right. <laughs> and and so I love that I grew up in a time when uh, you really gave the songs and the musicians and the music. And its own opportunity as a listener, not because it was simply a subset of something mm -hmm. else that that your group of people liked. Yeah, your sound. Um, you know, it's it. I've heard it described as Americana, but I can hear a lot of Canadiana in it mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So, who would you say, from that perspective? I mean. Chasing the Rain is such a beautiful song. So if anybody's listening Thank to this you. interview and is looking for an introduction into Kiefer Sutherland music, I would start there. But there's three albums, so you know there's a lot to investigate. Well, thank but you very much. but what? Uh, who would you say is one of your maybe c biggest Canadian influences? I mean, I could hear Tom Petty, but let's go Canadian for well, this. Tom Petty. Tom Petty is a yeah. huge influence. Um, you know. Uh, Neil Young is a huge yeah. influence. Joni Mitchell's a hu huge inf influence. Um, I hear also you're a, a Gordon Lightfoot fan, right? A huge Gordon Lightfoot so fan. So you got to know, I don't know when you're coming back up here, but at Massey Hall on May 23rd, they're doing a tribute mm. with the band's Blue Rodeo being the house band oh, and his band mm -hmm. being the other house band. There's going to have two house bands yeah. with all sorts of like Sylvia Tyson and oh, that's uh, Alison Russell, who's a great new artist. But like lots of folks who are going to be performing. So yeah. you might want to check that out. When, when I listen to, you know, and I've, I've had the great fortune of knowing uh, Gordon Lightfoot. I met him back in like 2001. Um, I mean, I just think he was one of the great songwriters of of English music, of, of English speaking music. Uh, and I'm certainly not, uh, I'm not a rare person in, in, in that idea. His delivery of songs was so unique too. I mean, when you take a look at the difference in, and, and just kind of the aggressive attack of a song like Sundown, and then just the kind of absolute unadored freedom of Carefree Highway. And then uh, the literal storytelling sense of something like the Edmund Fitzgerald. I mean, those are so three such incredibly diverse pieces of work. Yeah. Right. And the fact that you can attribute those to one artist uh, is, is, just, is just kind of mind-numbing, right? It, mm -hmm. it's a, that's a real special person. And, and I know he was very proud of the fact that Bob Dylan considered him one of the great songwriters of all time. And I know that that mattered a lot to him. And, and, and he was, and he deserved that. I mean, I think the last thing uh, Gordon Lightfoot had said to me, he, was, he played a show uh, down at the X, um, and I went down to see him, and, and I went back to see him very quickly after. Uh, and I said, man, I got to tell you, play an hour and hour, hour and 45 minutes set on your feet like that, 
you know, at a certain age, I got to take my hat off. And he just <laughs> smiled and he said, motion is the potion, Keith. <laughs> and uh, and I, I thought, well, that's, yeah, that's the <laughs> best advice I've ever yeah, heard. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you've now done so many interesting things, TV, film, and TV and <clears> film, <throat> The I guess the sort of the melding ha with streaming has changed how they used to be at such polar opposite ends and how they were put. I think it's put. long before streaming. But Maybe, yeah. you're right. But it yeah. seems to have sort of merged a bit more. But you've also now been on the road as a musician touring. Um, so sort of what is it that you hold for your future that you really want to focus on moving forward? I think, you know, the thing that's excited me about acting, and I really don't discern between television, film, or theater. Uh, it's, it's all the same process you just paint with a different stroke. Mm. So if I'm gonna work in a theater and the stage is you know, 20 feet deep and 40 feet wide, then I paint with a big stroke. Right. And if I'm working on a close-up lens that's a 75 and it's here and here, you just start to get more delicate. And that's the best way I can explain adjusting your process to the different mediums. But the, the work is actually the same. And the truth is, and the, the greatest education I had in this and the greatest kind of acknowledgement was was 24 taught me that working every day taught me how much I had left to learn and and was also so exciting because I was learning so much mm -hmm. as an actor um, so I think for me uh, as long as I feel that I have an opportunity to move forward and learn something mm -hmm. and get better it's always going to be exciting I mean that's that's the lure yeah um, and with music, uh, you know, I've played my whole life, um, not with a lot of confidence. And, and I had written some songs, and then I had different friends over the years kind of help me along and, and, and make me feel more confident in my songs. Uh, Till finally I recorded that first record uh, with Jude Cole. And I was really proud of the way it sounded. Yeah. Uh, then there was the whole learning how to tour. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I was learning so much at such a rate that it was just really exciting for me. Um, and, and, you know, I get nervous like everybody else and kind of overcoming that was really exciting and I thought on a personal level kind of really helpful for me. Um, so for all of those reasons, um, those are things that are hopefully going to be fascinating for mm -hmm. me uh, to the end of my days because I've got so much left to learn. Yeah. You've done so much in TV and film and with acting, and I would imagine that that's a world because you've been immersed in it, I think, longer as a performer than in the music oh world. Oh my gosh, by a long shot. So when I ask, that's why I want to ask you, who do you look f to for guidance to be a live performer as a musician? Who do you admire? Oh my gosh, there, there, there's two different things. Okay. So the, the first part, who do I look to? Uh, for guidance, it's me. Okay. Uh, because I'm the one standing there, and mm -hmm. I'm the one who's going to either uh, have a visceral reaction to what the audience is doing, mm -hmm. or I'm going to have to take it in a different direction, or, or, or you know, grab control of it at this moment, let it be gone at this moment. Mm -hmm. So, for all of those reasons, uh, you have to trust your own instincts. Um, there are so many performers that that I admire. I mean. It's someone I, who, I, who I absolutely admire and I would never be able to put on a show like someone like Prince. I think uh, the fact that he could dance the way he could dance, that he could sing and play while doing that uh, made him one of the most amazing performers. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, when I see someone like James Taylor and Neil Young with an acoustic guitar mm -hmm. and just kind of pull an audience in intimately, uh, I think that's an incredible skill and kind of fantastically in the middle. Um, there was a fantastic tour that you two did, and their stage, they had a stage, a thrust, and then it was a heart. Um, I can't remember the name of the tour, but there was a, there was a performance piece between Edge and Bono, and... With the dancer? No, no it was not just that the, one? It was, no, it was just the two of them. Oh, okay. And it was like two Goliaths battling each other. And Edge would use his guitar to knock Bono down, and Bono would come back <laughs> with a vocal. And 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 it and this is my fault as a storyteller. It might be sounding kitschy. It was one of the coolest, most committed things I'd seen. And so so 
I can find endless inspiration from other performers, mm -hmm. going all the way back to the Beatles and Elvis Presley, to people who have not even performed yet, <laughs> that will impress and move me down right. the line. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, it's on you to figure out how to harness it. And when you're out there, it's all on you. There, you right. Yeah, you can't go to anyone else at that <laughs> point. You, it's too late. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd just be calling for your mom. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you can't say cut. <laughs> no. no. You just got to keep on going. No, that is no. great. So in the last couple of years, there's been some great um, television from you, including we've got uh, The First Lady oh, and um, oh, Rabbit Hole. So mm -hmm. are, are those continuing? What's happening next with those projects? So, or? no, First Lady uh, was, was supposed to be a one-off the way it okay. was, and that was how that was going to go. Rabbit Hole had a potential of going on, but unfortunately the strike put an end to that, yeah. and it just, it, 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 the strike went on for over six months, and it just created such a deficit of mm. time between when we could rewrite mm. a, another season and go forward. So that was unfortunate because I really enjoyed making that. And we shot that here in Toronto. And right. so I was very excited about coming back to do that. Um, and then I got, I was hugely lucky uh, to finish a film with William Friedkin right before the strike started. And it was a remake of The Cane Mutiny, which was a great, fantastic Humphrey Bogart film. And that has just come out uh, on Paramount Plus and Showtime. And we just, unfortunately, because of the strike, we're not allowed to promote anything. So mm -hmm. it's kind of quietly gone out there, but we will start doing promotion for that again to re-release it, uh, starting with talk shows in New York in December and, and kind of do another platform release of that. Right, good. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, gonna ask you also about, um, well, first of all, <laughs> you are like Canadian royalty. Because this is of not your, true. Canada has no royalty. No, it's true. We don't. But we've got some pretty amazing Canadians. And this is you know, true. This is so, very true. And I think we like to use the word royalty to acknowledge how great they are. Yeah. So if we're going to start from your mom's side of the family, <coughs> you know, mm -hmm. thank you, healthcare, Tommy Douglas, mm -hmm. from your family mm -hmm. side. Your dad, legend, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, wonderful actor, and now on a stamp. Yes. So come on, how? Yeah. It, come on, that's pretty Canadian royalty. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's fantastic. And, so uh, yeah. No, and I, uh, I think he's very proud of it, and we are too. I think he said something that really touched my heart because <clears throat> it doesn't matter. And I'm sorry, by the way, about the loss of your mom a few you. years ago. But I think that you never sort of ever stop wanting to please your parents, whether mm -hmm. they're still here or not. Mm -hmm. And I remember when he got the stamp, I'm just going to mention this quickly, but he, he said, I wish my parents could have been, yeah. could seen this, that yeah. it meant that yeah. to him. And I thought that was lovely. Yeah. So, um, but yes, that is a very, you know, big Canadian honor. And I think that's wonderful. When I think about you and you, you know, your ties to Canada, let me ask you, um, what is it that draws you or that you enjoy about the Canadian connection beyond your family? I mean, that's an obvious. Again, it's, it's, uh, it, it, this will always go back to a nine-year-old kid coming home to Canada with his mom and his sister after things didn't go so well in the States for my mom. Uh, we didn't have two kind of shillings to scratch together. We ended up in a place called Crescent Town uh, in East York on Victoria Park in Danforth. Um, Rachel and I, uh, my twin sister, we had not a single friend, didn't know anybody. Um, my mom did not have a job. Um, and we were taken in. Uh, we were taken in in a way that is almost impossible to describe because people would just simply think you're lying. Uh, when, as we were moving in, people came out to say hello as the, as the truck was unloading furniture. Um, I had managed to make friends in the park later that day. And the acting community in Toronto uh, made sure my mom got work because they heard she was in trouble. Now, I've worked in a lot of different acting communities around the world. Uh, and those can be very tough communities. And they're competitive. Mm -hmm. And people, there's a lot of people wanting that same job. Um, and I don't think Toronto's any different. Um, but. There was a level of compassion that just outrode competition. And people made sure that she could get enough work to feed her family and, and start a career, uh, which ended up becoming one of the great stage careers in Canada. Yes. Um, so I just, 
my memory is always going to be that 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 and and it's also it's 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 something that I've acknowledged and I've been really fortunate to travel the world and really there's never been a place I've gone that I didn't enjoy having said that and I've been everywhere from Russia to China to South America Central America North America Europe uh, Australia uh, South Africa the Pacific Rim um, and I've met extraordinary people. But I have never met a large group of people that was more compassionate and understanding and helpful than I have Canadians. And that's the impression that was made upon me when I was nine, and that is what I'll hold on till till I die. Oh, that's a remarkably wonderful thing to have. And, yeah, you know, it is. It's very special. Yeah. And, well, you just know that you're always going to be welcome here. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I don't know how much time I have, if I can make one more question. So, you know, obviously, I mentioned earlier that our audience is very much wrapped up in 70s, 80s, and 90s music, and also the movies. Mm -hmm. So you definitely have been uh, come up in conversations when I take requests and people ref you know, will reference things like you know, uh, The Lost Boys or you know, Stand By Me or whatever. So going back to those, I guess those were 80s <clears> things, <throat> what's your memory of that time? And if you want to put a song or songs to it, what would, it, what would they be? Well, I think there were a couple moments, uh, and really quickly. Stand By Me, uh, when I was making that film, it was called The Body, mm -hmm. and River Phoenix was learning how to play guitar, and he was learning fast. Uh, and I was playing Stand By Me uh, by, by, Nate, by Benny King, and uh, when the night has come and land has fallen, and I was just kind of noodling through it, and River wanted to learn it, and so I was teaching it to him, and Rob Reiner had passed by and said, oh, wow, I haven't heard that song for a long time. Now, I have no idea what ultimately led him to naming the film Stand By Me, but I did find that quite a coincidence. Um, and so that was kind of a, a cool moment uh, where whatever I was playing kind of felt kind of important at that time. Lost Boys was another experience where Films did not come with soundtracks that were not soundtrack oriented. So, for instance, Footloose was a dance movie. Um, uh, Flashdance was a dance movie. Um, Lost Boys was not that. So, for it to have a soundtrack was kind of putting a soundtrack to a sensibility and a time. Um, so, that was really exciting. And I think Joel Schumacher put together an awesome record for that. But the one that will always stand out to me the most was when we were making Young Guns. And, and we were having the time of our lives, and, and there were a lot of different people that Emilio knew that wanted to be in a Western because they didn't think they were going to ever make another one after this. And so you'll never see it in the movie. Well, it is in the movie, but you won't recognize them. But I shot Tom Cruise off a roof, who was wearing a beard, because uh, he really wanted to be in a Western. And then John Bon Jovi was a really good friend of Emilio's, and Emilio shot him off a roof. Uh, in a fight sequence. And then we went to dinner later. And we've all had a few drinks and we're getting kind of drunk and stupid. And, and But John's trying to have a serious conversation with Emilio. And he says, look, I want to I do the soundtrack for the sequel. And Emilio's, oh, come on. We don't even know if there's going to be a sequel. And John grabbed Emilio's hand and went, don't be stupid. <laughs> and everybody stopped talking. And he went, there's going to be a sequel. <laughs> And we started laughing. And John had been writing on these two napkins that ended up three napkins. And he said, I want to do the music for it. And this is the first song. And he'd written Blaze of Glory at the table uh, in about 20 minutes. And we were all laughing at him. It's like, no one writes a song in 20 minutes. This is the dumbest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. I can't even read his writing. It wasn't because his writing wasn't good. Yeah. It was, we were we were baked <laughs> and it, it was done and, and oh, yeah. anyways five months later I'm up in Montana where I lived at the time and I've come into town to get something for like a remote for my TV or whatever and I go into the store and the video for Blaze of Glory is all <laughs> over the TVs I hadn't seen a TV for months I'm like holy he did it <laughs> and I 
went back to Los Angeles and uh, getting ready for the sequel to open up. And I went to Amelia and I said, can you believe it? That's that song, right? That yeah. It's, it's like number one in the country, I think. And he said, come here, I want to show you something. And he opened the door to his office and Emilio had the three napkins framed. Wow. He, he, had, he was smart enough at least to keep them. <laughs> so, so that was kind of an amazing thing when I realized uh, if you have conviction, you can get her done. And, and uh, John Bon Jovi, I watched do it in person. So that yeah, was cool. What a great story. Oh, my yeah, gosh. Yeah. That's terrific. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. This oh, has been you. really nice chatting well, with you. Well, for me, too. For and, me too. you know, you've got so much talent and so much on the go. All I can say is I wish you all the best Thank with you. everything that you're endeavoring. Well, I wish you the same, May. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. Absolute pleasure, Don. <laughs> Boom 97.3, 70s, 80s, 90s. And I want some whiskey. Come on. <laughs>